We're beginning chapter 16. Blood glucose was fine, but the patients died. The story of... Oh, God. Ros... Rosglitazone is one of death, greed, and corruption. The trust between doctors and patient, researcher and participant, or author and editor is undermined when the foundations on which evidence is built are treated with such usual contempt. Editorial The Lancet. Comfortable. The FDA approved raw. I gotta figure out how to say this. Raw sig. Raw siglidazone. The FDA approved raw siglidazone. Avandia in 1999, although there were more thrombotic heart events with the drug than with placebo or active comparators. Relative risk, 1.895% confidence, interval 0.9 to 3.6. The FDA reviewer had adjusted for time on drug, which brought the relative risk down to 1.1. However, as stated in the package insert, the drug increased LDL cholesterol by 19%, which explains its harmful effects on the heart. The cholesterol-lowering drug as Timabi was approved in 2002 based on a 15 to 18% reduction in LDL cholesterol, which was presumed to confer cardiovascular benefits. Thus, a lowering of LDL cholesterol by 15 to 18% without evidence of clinical benefit led to drug approval in one case, whereas an increase by the same amount with clinical evidence of harm didn't lead the FDA to reject rosiglitazone. This illustrates again the failure at the drug agencies in protecting public health. In Europe, the MA was so concerned that it rejected the drug only to approve it a year later, despite there being no new evidence. It isn't clear why, but Silvio Garthini was on EMA's committee and had described how the companies bring forward paid opinion leaders who give favorable presentations at committee meetings. A member of the committee told the BMJ that he had been contacted by respected members of the diabetes community who urged him to approve the wonder drug. Garthini's view was that there was no need for the drug, as there were already so many that were more or less the same. He explained that the long-term trials required after marketing approval are highly beneficial for the companies, which have every reason in the world to be slow with the trials, that the drug was off patent when the bad results came in. An even better strategy was to ignore the demands and, in fact, only about a third of FDA requests for post-marketing studies are ever carried out. In 1999, the company, then known as SmithKline, became completed a trial that found more cardiac problems with rosiglitazone than with pro. I've, I've heard this. I, pio, pioglitazone. I guess I haven't heard that one. But according to an internal email. These data should not see the light of day to anyone outside of GlaxoSmithKline. Instead of publishing the results, the company spent the next 11 years trying to cover them up. Marianne Ryan, a GlaxoSmithKline spokeswoman, said that the company had not provided the results of its study because they did not contribute any significant new information. Apparently it did also for Glaxo, as the results made the company decide against further comparisons. In 2004, the World Health Organization sent Glaxo an alert about cardiac events, and the company performed a meta-analysis that confirmed this, 
which it sent to the FDA and the EMA in 2006. However, none of the agencies made the findings public because of the proprietary nature of company's trial results. This absurd interpretation of the proprietary nature of companies, wait a minute, this absurd interpretation of ownership of data and results is not only deeply unethical, it is also wrong and it also violates the fundamental principles on which the European Union is founded. But as also as we allow regulators to believe in their own nonsense and putting profit before survival of patients, it allows the companies to push dr the drugs aggressively and hope they can make billions of dollars before someone finds out. As former editor of the New England Journal of Medicine, Jerome Kessier expressed it, Rosiglinazone was Glaxo's second best-selling drug. At about $3 billion a year, and Glaxo behaved like drug pushers in the street, as they could have informed the public about the dangers with its drug, but it didn't. In 2006, Glaxo sent an updated analysis to the FDA with five more trials confirming the harm, but yet again, the FDA failed to warn the patients and the physicians. Perhaps the FDA was duped by an observational study Glaxo had also submitted, performed by a commercial vendor, which showed no increase in risk. However, Glaxo had carefully avoided to report to the FDA what this study had shown when rosiglitazone was compared with pioglitazone. This comparison showed that Rosiglitazone led to more admissions to hospital which with myocardial infarction than pioglitazone. I believe that the omission is scientific misconduct, given that Glaxo already knew that pioglitazone is a better drug. Rosiglitazone was now the most sold diabetes drug in the world, but in 2007, all hell broke loose for Glaxo. As part of a legal settlement in relation to the company's fraud with paroxidine, Glaxo was required to post the results of its clinical trials on a website. This enabled independent researchers Stephen Nyson and Kathy Wolfsky to have a closer look at rosiglitazone. Their, two, their 2007 meta-analysis of 42 trials, 27 of which were unpublished, showed that the drug causes myocardial infarction and cardiovascular death. Diabetes drugs are supposed to lower cardiovascular mortality, not increase it, but as just noted, the shocking news was not news for Glaxo. The company had known about this for eight years, but failed to warn the regulatory authorities and the public. Three years later, the U.S. Senate Finance Committee released a 334-page investigation of rosiglitazone and Glaxo, which, me which mentioned internal company emails and documents that give us a rare insight into the conduct of a major drug company. Nyssen and Wolski submitted their meta-analysis to the New England Journal of Medicine on May 1, 2007. The manuscript was sent to peer review and only two days after submission, an academic peer, review, academic peer reviewer broke the rules and faxed the manuscript to Glaxo. Despite its confidential nature, Glaxo circulated the manuscript to more than 40 scientists and executives at the highest levels in the company. On the 8th of May, Glaxo's head of research admitted internally that the FDA and Glaxo had come to similar conclusions about the increased risk with rosiglitazone as the submitted meta-analysis did. Yet the next day, Glaxo had its key lies ready, which they called key messages, and which were that the meta-analysis was based on incomplete evidence and the company strongly disagreed with its conclusions. Already on the 10th of May, four, four Glaxo scientists and executives 
met with Stephen Nyson after having asked for a meeting. As Glaxo had previously threatened John Buse, Nyson secretly taped the meeting. Because of Nyson's meta-analysis, Glaxo had decided to unblind the collection data on its ongoing trial, which the EMA had required the company to carry out because of cardiovascular safety concerns when it approved the drug in 2000. An internal email suggested that if the Independent Academic Steering Committee for the trial wouldn't agree to publish interim results, the company would pursue that the line the company would pursue the line that a decision had been made live with it. Glaxo convinced the steering committee that an interim analysis should be published, but the committee didn't know that Glaxo had already unblinded the results two weeks earlier. The committee apparently believed it was their decision to unblind the study and publish. At the meeting with Nyson, an executive said, Let's suppose record was done tomorrow and the hazard ratio was 1.12. This comment was made four days before the company claimed it unblinded the trial and 14 days before the steering committee was asked to approve the unblinding. The hazard ratio that was, unpub was unpublished was about the same, 1.11. At the meeting with Nyson, an executive said, let's suppose record was, oh wait, no, I just said, I just read that. Funded by Glaxo, Phil at home, Philip Home at Al published what they called an unplanned interim analysis electronically in New England Journal of Medicine only two weeks after Nyson and Wolski published their meta-analysis in the same journal on June 14th. Glaxo succeeded to publish a large trial reporting on 4,447 patients, followed for four years, only seven weeks after they heard about a meta-analysis that threatened the survival of their product. In contrast, it can take companies five or ten years to publish results they don't like, if they publish them at all. Companies are surely able to act fast in the case of a drug emergency. What made the New England Journal of Medicine decide to publish an unplanned intern analysis of an ongoing trial, to publish it so quickly and to accept it despite its poor design, for example, the drug trials weren't even blinded. And FDA scientist Tomic, Thomas Marciniak said that the FDA would have found the trials design unacceptable. My take on this trial is that the journal has far lower standards for industry trials than for other types of research and that it has allowed its integrity to be corrupted by Big Pharma for financial gains. There were eight authors. One was from Glaxo and the other seven were consultants on company payroll. They talked about exceptional circumstances, but didn't specify that these were the one, wait a minute, but they didn't specify that these were, that one of their comrades had stolen Nyson's manuscript, motivating them to report unplanned interim findings, and they regarded their findings as inconclusive. It's, unbelie it's unbelievable and scandalous that the New England Journal of Medicine let them get away with this. Nowhere is the reader told what the exceptional circumstances were and the editors didn't ensure the authors explained it in the paper. When the final results were published in the Lancet two years later, they appeared to be false. The event rate for heart attacks was less than one-third of that observed in a similar trial with pioglitazone, and the paper claimed that raw siglitazone was administered during 88% of the follow-up, which was mathematically implausible, given the other information about the trial. Since the 1950s, the FDA has required the trunk companies to turn over 
all individual patent case reports from their studies. This permits reanalysis of how each case was coded and enabled Marciniak to scrutinize the record trial data. The EMA has accepted the company's findings that the risk of complications was the same, 14.5% for rosiglitazone and 14.4% for the comparator. However, when Marciniak studied 549 case reports, he found many missing cases of cardiac problems that favored rosiglitazone 4 to 1. For one patient, there were 1,438 pages, and for most of the other 4,500 patients, there were several hundred pages, making a review of all case reports a huge task. Marciniak concluded that the case report forms are essential for understanding this study, and he found that rosiglitazone increased cardiovascular risk also in the record trial. In contrast to, Glaxo, to Glaxo's manus, manipulated results. Very importantly, Marciniak stated that even with blinded adjudication, biased referral for adjudication of cases and data by unblinded investigators and site monitors may lead to biases in event rates. Very importantly, Marciniak stated that even with blinded adjudication, wait a minute, yeah, I just read that, didn't I? Yeah, yes, I did. The importance of this statement cannot be overestimated. The sponsor has access to the data and knows who received which drug. And biased selection of unclear cases for review by an independent committee is an important reason why industry trials should be distributed. Grave suspicions were raised earlier. The editorial that accompanied intern publication for the record trial mentioned that the trial had found an exceptionally low rate and in a high-risk population of patients with diabetes and noted that the most likely explanation was incomplete ascertainment of events. The editorialists also noted that rosiglitazone increased the risk of a heart attack to the same degree as lipid-lowering statins lowered the risk. However, as the FDA wanted it otherwise, according to the documents released by the Senate, a top official at the FDA, John Jenkins, director of the agency's Office of New Drugs, preferred to continue to put patients at risk. He argued internally that rosiglitazone should remain on the market and briefed the company extensively on the agency's internal debate. According to a sealed deposition, a top company official wrote after he spoke with Jenkins that it is clear the Office of New Drugs is trying to find minimal language that will satisfy the Office of Drug Safety. In the deposition, Rosemary Jonan Liang, a former supervisor in the Drug Safety Office, who left the FDA after she was disciplined for recommending that rosiglitazone's heart warnings be strengthened, said of Jenkins' conversations with GlaxoSmithKline that this should not happen, and she suggests that people have to make a determination about the leadership at the FDA. Rosiglitazone was suspended in Europe in September 2010, whereas the process at the FDA continued to be fishy. In July 2010, the FDA held a new advisory committee to decide if the drug should remain on the market. This was five months after the damning Senate report, but that didn't deter the higher-ups in the agency from more wrongdoing. In an unprecedented move, the FDA invited additional people to its meeting who had been involved in a similar 2007 meeting but were no longer active members of either committee. Most of these people had voted for keeping the drug on the market in 2007, and their addition to the 2010 meeting tipped the scale from voting for a withdrawal to voting for keeping it on the market, 
which was what the FDA decided. The scandal rambled on. In 2009, Glaxo started the TIDE trial, scheduled to end in 2015. It is unethical as, as it compares the cardiovascular safety of rosiglitazone to pioglitazone, although the company knew that rosiglitazone increases the risk of myocardial infarction compared to pioglitazone. Furthermore, the information given to the patients being asked to volunteer for the trial was seriously misleading and therefore also unethical. Because U.S. and European physicians were not willing to enroll patients, Glaxo exploited developing countries, but in 2010, India's controllers stopped the trial. Two FDA safety officers also suggested to stop the trial, and it was unethical to and it was unethical and exploitative and to take raw ciglitazone off the market as it causes 500 heart attacks and 300 cases of heart failure every month in the United States. Nothing was done initially, but later the FDA halted the trial. The same year Glaxo had the nerve to say in a statement to the BMJ that the record trial had shown its drug performs similarly as the comparators. Glaxo also said that a head-to-head -head trial would prove that rosiglitazone doesn't increase the risk of myocardial infarction and that the evidence suggesting that it does was not scientific. Glaxo's lies are not of this world. In 2010, Stephen Nyson published The Rise and Fall of Rosiglitazone, an online editorial in the European Heart Journal. Glaxo's head of research and development, Monsef Slawi, wrote to the journal that Nyson's editorial was rife with inaccurate representations and speculation that fall well outside the realm of accepted scientific debate. We strongly disagree with several key points within the editorial, most importantly those which imply misconduct on the part of GlaxoSmithKline. Slowey asked the journal to withdraw the editorial from its website and not to print it in the journal's hard copy edition until the journal has investigated these inaccuracies and unsubstantiated allegations. When the journal didn't give in, but published the editorial in print, Slowey said that there was absolutely no attempt to suppress the editorial. Glaxo called Nyssen's meta-analysis a hypothesis that had not been confirmed by more recent and considerably more robust evidence from prospective long-term cardiovascular outcome studies. Absolute bullshit. A meta-analysis of the randomized trials is the most reliable evidence we have, and it is not a hypothesis. It provides de definitive proof. Glaxo also remarked that the American Heart Association and the American College of Cardiology Foundation had said that insufficient data exists to support the choice of pioglitazone over rosic rosiglitazone. If that is true, it only shows how corrupt these organizations are. They should be the most concerned when a drug causes heart attacks. So what did the FDA do when it didn't want to lower the number of deaths among diabetes patients by taking the drug off the market as in Europe? It issued meaningless warnings the standard fake fix. It stated that rosiglitazone should only be used in patients already being treated with the drug, and in those patients whose blood sugar cannot be controlled with other drugs who have drugs and who, wait a minute, I gotta start that over. It should only be used in patients already being treated with the drug, and in those patients whose blood sugar cannot be controlled with other drugs, and who, after consulting with their healthcare professional, do not wish to use pioglitazone. Can you see what is wrong with this advice? At least four things. First, 
Why on earth should a patient continue with a harmful drug only because the patient is already on the drug? I think the patient would prefer a less harmful drug, as you never know when a myo myocardial infarction strikes. Second, we don't use drugs to control blood sugar, but to lower the risk of complications to diabetes such as cardiovascular events. So do... So to get off the drug, that must be a typo. So to get off the drug immediately, no matter what the FDA says, maybe not. So do get off the drug immediately, no matter what the FDA says. Third, as the endocrinologist thought it was a wonder drug, it might not be a good idea for the patients to consult their healthcare professional. In fact, it has been shown that doctors who take money from manufacturers of rosiglitazone were substantially more prone to recommend the drug than other doctors, even after the FDA had warned about its cardiovascular harms. Fourth, what plausible reaction could there be that a patient would not want to use pioglitazone when that drug seems to be safer? The FDA's stubbornness is a considerable threat to public health. By 2009, even the heavily industry-supported endocrinologists had woken up and a consensus group of the U.S. and European Diabetes Association unanimously advised against using rosiglitazone. These events are so bizarre that they raise uncomfortable questions. Did someone higher up in the FDA hierarchy receive a load of money from Glaxo at some secret bank account or in a suitcase that left no trails? Considering that enormous sales of rosiglitazone, even $100 million in bribes, would be peanuts. I am not saying this happened, but if not, what could then be the explanation for these series of implausible events? Future rewards? The oddities don't even stop there. The risk of myocardial infarction with rosiglitazone seems to be increased about 80% in 2010. The FDA decided that trials of diabetes drugs should show that the risk of cardiovascular events is clearly less than 80%. To allow this degree of permitted risk is incredible particularly since we use diabetes drugs to decrease the risk of cardiovascular risk, certainly not to allow a certain increase. The asymmetry and lack of consistency in regulatory decision-making is dangerous for patients. In 2007, there was almost unanimous agreement in the FDA Advisory Committee that rosiglitazone increases cardiovascular risk but the committee nevertheless recommended that the drug should stay on the market. If there had been almost, oh, wait a minute, if there had been almost unanimous agreement about the harms when the drug was first submitted for marketing approval, approval, it would hardly have been approved. The assertion that a drug agency considers that a drug's benefit outweighs its harms, which we hear all the time when troubles accumulate. Also, for rosiglitazone in 2007, are unhelpful. It's not easy to compare benefits and harms as they aren't measured on the same scale, and it's never made explicit how agencies arrive at gracious conclusions, which more than anything else seem to be convenience statements aimed at getting the agency off the hook and avoid disturbing their industry friends and their powerful allies among the politicians. The FDA's meaningless warnings about rosiglitazone are typical. If you analyze these text in package inserts, you'll see how <clears throat> illogical and otherworldly it often is. For many years, I joked about the general warning that a drug should be used with caution in pregnancy. How should this be done? Either you use a drug or you don't. I have kept a 1998 Janssen Silag 
package insert from the time when my children suffered repeated from repeatedly from pinworms and the whole family needed treatment. It says that the use of Mebendazole, Vermox, during the pregnancy and breastfeeding should always occur in consultation with the doctor because there is no experience with the use of the drug under these conditions. Great advice. What exactly is the doctor supposed to do? In this case, the doctor was me or my wife, as we are both doctors. She wasn't pregnant, but if she had been, we would have preferred to live with anal itching rather than running an unknown risk of giving birth to a malformed baby. Pioglitazone causes heart fa failure, but it is still on the market as it is believed to be safer than rosiglazone. However, serious questions about trial conduct have been raised also for this drug. A large trial, the proactive study of 5,238 patients comparing pioglitazone with placebo failed to find significant benefit for its primary outcome, which was a composite endpoint of various adverse cardiovascular events. This was the true result. The drug didn't work. The trial protocol had been published and it stated that this outcome was chosen because the aim of the study was to evaluate overall effects on macrovascular disease. However, when the trial was published in The Lancet, there was an additional composite outcome, which consisted of patients who died or had a non-fatal heart attack or stroke, and for which P was 0.03, this was called the main secondary endpoint, although it didn't exist in the protocol. Several, several observers commented on the discrepancy and the authors, which included two people from the sponsors, Eli Lilly and Takeda, defended themselves by saying that the new composite outcome was introduced in the final statistical analysis plan, which was, which was released in May 2005 and sent to the FDA. They also said that it's legitimate to change outcomes during the, a study's conduct provided it's agreed before any knowledge of unblinded trial data by the trialists. Finally, they stated that the proactive executive committee was not aware of any results of the study before the official unblinding of the study on May 25th, 2005. Man, I need sunglasses. It is important to be the devil's advocate here, as we know we cannot trust the drug companies. The final visits for all patients were completed in January 2005, four months before the analysis plan was changed and a new outcome was invented. Both companies were represented at the steering committee and its executive committee. Furthermore, the statements in the author's defense were carefully worded as if they had been cleared with lawyers. Could a company statistician have peeped at the data behind the academic investigators back before the final analysis plan was suggested to them? Such scenario isn't speculative. As noted in Chapter 5, we analyzed 44 protocols for industry-sponsored trials and found it was stated explicitly in 16 cases that the sponsor had access to accumulating data while a trial was running. We know, who, wait a minute, who knows in how many other cases the sponsor had access to the data but was smart enough not to write in this in the protocol. 
It reflects poor trial conduct and isn't something the companies want to tell the world about, as it was only mentioned in one of 44 publications. If that were the case for the proactive study, all of the statements in the Lancet letter might nonetheless have been technically correct. The trialist might not have been unblinded and the executive committee might have not known about the results. But the company statistician likely knew about the results because the trial had data and the safety monitoring board, whose job it is to warn about excessive harms that might lead, that might emerge while the trial is running. For obvious reasons, we should be deeply skeptical toward companies final statistical analysis plans after a lot of data has arrived. The incentive to cheat is huge. As noted earlier, the difference between an honest data analysis and a less honest data analysis can be worth billions on the world market. It shouldn't surprise anyone that cheating is exceedingly common. But, un but until recently, it was difficult to prove as trial protocols were regarded as confidential. We succeeded to get access to a cohort of protocols <clears throat> submitted to a research ethics committee in Copenhagen that allowed us to study the extent of cheating with the pre-declared outcomes. We identified 102 protocols, which included both industry-funded, about three quarters, and non-industry-funded trials that had all been published. To our great surprise, at least one <clears throat> protocol defined primary outcome had been changed 63% of the trials, and in 33% of the trials, a new primary outcome was introduced in the public report that didn't exist in the protocol. Here comes the worst part. Not a single publication acknowledged that primary outcome had been changed. The reason this is so devastating for trustworthiness of trials is that there are often many outcomes which may further divide or combine creating even more chances of hitting the bullseye. Imagine you are firing a gun towards many targets that are partly overlapping. If you are a poor shot, there is a good chance you'll hit near the center of one of the targets. If you want to cheat, you'll say that the target you hit was also the one you aimed at. Even better, you may wipe out some or all of the other targets you invite the audience in to see how good of a shot you are. Wiping out other targets corresponds to not mentioning how good of a shot you are. What? Wiping out other targets corresponds to not mentioning outcomes stated in your protocol. Oh, I gotta start this all over. If you want to cheat, you'll say that the target you hit was also the one you aimed at. Even better, you may wipe out some or all of the other targets before you invite an audience to see how good of a shot you are. Wiping out other tar targets corresponds to not mentioning outcomes stated in your protocol. Another common practice in clinical trials we found that 71% of trials had at least one unreported outcome, and in these trials, a median of four efficacy and three harm outcomes were missing in the publications. We have published other revealing papers based on our cohort of trial protocols. For example, we found unacknowledged discrepancies, we found unacknowledged discrepancies between protocols and publications for sample size calculation 18 by 34 18 out of 34 trials methods of handling 24 25 out of 42 subgroup analyses 25 out of 25 and adjusted analyses 23 of 28 in term analyses were described in 13 protocols but mentioned in only five corresponding publications. It is clear that trial reports cannot be trusted and that we need to have access to the full protocols and the raw data. 
The MA agrees. The Ross Siglin his own scandal made the MA's new director, Guido Rossi, say that in 2012 that the agency needs to analyze the raw data rather than accepting aggregated information submitted by drug companies seeking approval. Speaking of statistics, there is another issue with the proactive trial that smells. The trial report mentions 14 cases of bladder cancer on drug and six placebo. This difference wasn't statistically significant and could therefore be explained away by the company's salespeople. However, four years later, it was revealed that one of the cases in the placebo group was benign and 14 versus 5 is statistically significant. The reason this smells is that such errors always favor the company that controls data, data analysis and the writing of the report. A final point that glitazones illustrate so nicely is that we cannot rely on surrogate outcomes. Rosiglitazone and pioglitazone reduce glucose to the same degree and both increase the risk of heart failure. However, while rosiglitazone definitely increases cardiovascular events, the overall effect of pioglitazone is more uncertain. In 2011, four members of the EMA committee dealing with an application for generic pioglitazone gave a diversion statement. It appears impossible to define a subpopulation of diabetic patients where the benefits of pioglitazone would outweigh the risks. Sometimes researchers declare they have validated surrogate marker. Wait a minute. Sometimes researchers declare they have validated a surrogate marker. Don't believe them, as it cannot be done. All drugs have many effects, and we cannot pick just one of them and say this effect will tell us what we need to know. For example, both rosiglitazone and pioglitazone <clears throat> increase body weight and f fractures, and rosiglitazone has an adverse effect on LDL cholesterol, none of which are related to their effect on glucose. In the proactive study, pioglitazone increased body weight by 4 kilograms compared to placebo, which isn't a beneficial effect for patients with diabetes. It was also worrying that for every 62 patients treated with pioglitazone, one additional patient was admitted to hospital with heart failure, with a, which is a serious condition. In 2011, the FDA warned that pioglitazone may be associated with an increased risk of bladder cancer. There is, again, may be associated with an increased risk. Three wool and mouth terms in just seven words. Drug agencies just won't acknowledge the harms of drugs they have approved. Pioglitazone more than doubles the increase of bladder cancer and was withdrawn from this reason in France in 2001. When I drink whiskey or have sex, I cannot say it may be associated with an increased chance of well-being. It feels good. Troglitazone resumin was withdrawn in the UK in 1997 and in the United States in 2000 because it may be associated with an increased risk of liver failures. Sorry, I meant it causes liver failure. It was approved despite doubts about both efficacy and safety, but the experienced FDA medical officer who had reviewed the drug was removed at the request of the company. Park Davis before the advisory committee vote. I fully understand if you have become angry after having seen so much fraud and abuse of power that harm and kills patients, but that's exactly why I wrote this book, to wake people up to what is happening. The worst is still to come in the next two chapters about psychiatric drugs. Park Davis cheated the advisory committee by saying that the risk of liver toxicity was comparable to placebo and that additional data from other studies confirmed that the rate of liver damage was very similar. 
When the company provided these additional data a week after approval, they showed a substantially greater risk with the drug than with the placebo. As usual, the FDA responded by a fake fix. It advised monthly liver function tests, but they were rarely performed. For example, in only 1% of patients after four months. What is more serious is that it's a fatally incorrect assumption that liver tests prevent liver failure. Outright fraud was also an issue. When cases of serious liver damage occur, accumulate, Park Davis tightened the criterion for abnormal, those treated with the drug, but not for those treated with placebo, whereby they occurred the true risk for the FDA. When a new advisory committee reviewed the drug again in March 1999, the committee voted 11 to 1 to keep it on the market. But nine of the 10 physicians who reported on safety were paid consultants to the company. Is there anything the FDA doesn't allow? In Europe, Glaxo Welcome took Resulin off the UK market after only three months because of rapidly increasing reports of liver damage. And Glaxo and the Japanese company that had developed the product withdrew applications for marketing in 26 additional countries. At the FDA, however, the story rolled on. As depressing as always, intimidation of scientists that warned about the drug and protection of the drug by higher-ups. David Graham reported that the drug increased the risk of liver failure by a factor of 1,200, whereas the company assisted by nine prominent diabetes experts who were later shown to be on company payroll, claimed the incidence was only one in 100,000. I greatly admire people like Graham who, against all odds, stay at the FDA and do what they can to protect patients, when most people with their heart in the right place would have run screamingly away from an institution like that. Park Davis continued lying. It wrote to U.S. doctors that Glaxo Welcome had temporarily suspended marketing and that it only had experience with 5,000 patients, although Glaxo's decision was based on cases of liver failure worldwide, including those in the United States. The company also had reassured the doctors that the new reports had not indicated a greater potential for serious harm than previously estimated. At the same time, the National Institute of Health conducted a trial to see if troglitazone could prevent healthy people becoming diabetic. Prevent help healthy people becoming diabetic, yeah. The director of its diabetes division, Richard Eastman, wrote to the doctors who had enrolled the patients that Glaxo's decision was apparently a marketing decision and that the National Institute of Health was comfortable with continuing troglitazone. Eastman had received $78,000 from the company as a consultant to Park Davis, but when this was revealed in a newspaper, neither his boss nor the university-based chairman of the city saw any problems with it. Six months after Eastman's reassuring letter, a healthy teacher died of rapidly progressing liver failure and was no way... Wait. Fuck. Six months after Eastman's reassuring letter, a healthy teacher died of rapidly progressing liver failure and there was no way the regular liver tests could have prevented this from happening. At this point, the NIH discontinued the troglitazone arm in their study, but the drug remained on the U.S. market for almost another two years. Why? Why three years more in the United States than the United Kingdom? War crimes. Independent researchers saved the FDA from yet another diabetes scandal. <sighs> Maru Glatazar 
has a similar mechanism of action to the glitazones, and an FDA advisory committee recommended approval of the drug. However, independent researchers who analyzed the trial data submitted to the FDA found that Bristol Myers Squibb and Merck had produced flawed analyses and that the drug was harmful. The company's presentation to the advisory committee concluded that no significant excess risk of death or cardiovascular events occurred with muroglitazone. However, there was a twofold increased risk in the composite outcome of death, heart attack, or stroke, and sevenfold increase in heart failure, albeit with a wide confidence interval. The drug increased weight and oedemia like the glitazones do. The Freedom of Information Act made the independent analysis possible and it saved many lives. Although the FDA had already prepared an approval letter, it refused to approve the drug after the analysis, after this analysis. Fuck the FDA. Getting into the sun here. Saving my phone. Good lord, it's getting hot. I have no doubt about what I should do if I should get type 2 diabetes. I would eat less and exercise more. These are highly effective interventions. The best we have, considering also that they won't kill us. However, when the nonprofit American Diabetes Association on its website announced that diabetes management involves more than blood sugar control, mainly blood pressure and cholesterol control, there was nothing about the best there was nothing about the best interventions, weight loss and exercise. Perhaps because the so-called nonprofit organizations leading this initiative had many corporate sponsors. AstraZeneca, Adventist, Bristol Myers Squibb, Eli Lilly, GlaxoSmithKline, Merck Sharing Plow, Monarch, Novartis, Pfizer, and Wyeth. If I decided to take a drug, it would be metformin, which is old and very cheap, and which, in contrast to the other drugs, actually reduces cardiovascular morbidity, morbidity and all causes of mortality and even reduces body weight slightly it is clearly the best drug and was introduced to the united kingdom already in 1958 in canada in 1972 but not in the united states until 1995 perhaps it tells us something about unrestrained capitalism and u.s health care that the fda has been so quick to approve expensive and harmful drugs while the best and cheapest drug was introduced so late the extent to which the diabetes area has been corrupted is sickening the endocrine society in the united states is supposed to be an academic society for diabetes doctors but invites companies to get complete access to endocrine market marketplace by partnering with the endocrine society which offers the full range of endocrinologists you want to reach to fit your needs i could vomit the society's first practice guideline recommended testosterone to be measured in all men above 50 years of age and also that the treatment might be warranted even if the level wasn't low when the symptoms suggested a hormone deficiency I could vomit again, a horrendously dangerous guideline, as testosterone increases the risk of prostate cancer, and as no screening trials have ever been performed that might tell us whether this advice does more harm than good. Such a trial is actually not needed. I am pretty sure it would show that screening for low testosterone Whatever is supposed to mean is harmful. I don't understand why my colleagues have sold out their common sense. Money isn't that important, particularly not for people who are already very wealthy. 
It's green. Almost done, guys. Novo Nordisk interferes with an academic publication. In 2011, academic researchers published a paper in gastrointestinology that reported an increased risk of pancreatitis and, pan and pancreatic cancer in patients with diabetes treated with 2 glucagon like peptide 1 drugs. They had to use the FDA's database of reported adverse events of drugs and an elegant design. Their results were convincing and they also agreed with animal experiments with an analysis performed by the Drug Commission of the German Medical Association that found 11 reports of pancreatic cancer, with one of the drugs which was an unusually high number compared with other diabetic drugs. The study was published in the journal's website in February 2011 which said it was an unedited manuscript that had been accepted for publication and that the manuscript would undergo copy editing typesetting and review of the resulting proof before it was published in its final, for final form. Excuse me. <sighs> Novo Nordisk had a glucagon. I'm going to call it a glucagon. I think that's what it is. Novo Nordisk had a glucagon like peptide one drug on the market. Lyra glutide. Lyra glu Lyra glutide. Lyra glutide. Victoza and its researcher director, Mad Krosgaard Thompson, wrote a six page letter to the editor potentially damaging controversial analysis to be published in gastrointestinology. The letter ended by saying, on behalf of Novo Nordisk, in order to ensure the most optimal guidance to patients and public re reaction, we would urge gastrointestinology to withhold the publication of Elishoff et al. until it has been confirmed by an independent statistical analysis. Noble's actions become particularly absurd when we consider the facts. When Novo sought approval of the drug, grave concerns about liraglutide were raised at the FDA by two reviewing pharmacologists and a clinical safety reviewer. The safety reviewer said in her statement that she didn't recommend approval because in the United States, there are already 11 cases of drugs approved for glycemic control in type 2 diabetes. The need for therapies for type 2 diabetes is not so urgent that one must tolerate a significant degree of uncertainty regarding serious risk concerns. Victoza was approved in January 2010 against the advice of the FDA's own reviewers. The director of the FDA's Office of Drug Evaluation II, Curtis Rosebaugh, swept aside the criticisms and explained that while many sponsors may responsibly introduce a drug into marketing, theirs is a profit-based business and the pressures to generate revenue are strong. Also, with most classes of drugs, there are similar drugs in development from, com from competitors which places even more pressures to generate profit before there is more competition. Sidney Wolf from Public Citizen said about this remark that it was the kind of com comment the one would expect. It is the kind of comment one would expect from the drug sponsor or one from Wall Street, not from a high ranked FDA official. In June 2011, Noble had warned all U.S. doctors about the adverse effects of Victoza. The FDA had demanded this after a study had shown the doctors had far too little focus on the harms of the drug. The FDA warned that the drug may cause thyroid tumors and pancreatitis, which is a risk factor of, which is, which is a risk factor for pancreatic cancer. It also stated that it shouldn't be used as initial treatment until additional studies had been completed 
and required studies of cardiovascular safety and establishment of a cancer regist registry to study the occurrence of thyroid and other cancers. In April 2012, Public Citizen sent a petition to the FDA asking the agency to ban Victoza. Experiments had shown that mice were genetically predisposed to pancreatic cancer development. Wait a minute. Experiments had shown that mice were genetically predisposed to pancreatic cancer developed pancreatic cancer more quickly than usual in response to one of the glucagon-like peptide 1 drugs. I believe the academic researchers were right and that we shall see a withdrawal of the Victo of Victoza because of its harms, just like so many other diabetes drugs, and that those should have been withdrawn but never were, like talbutamide tol and rosiglitazone in the United States. That's it for chapter, what was it, 16? Yeah, chapter 17, psychiatry. The drug industry's paradise. Ah, oh, yes. Until next time.